Welcome to this video about how we write requirements documents using EARS in the Mechatronics Research Group. In a previous video I explained EARS, the easy approach to requirements syntax. If you don't know what EARS is, I recommend to first get a basic understanding of the EARS syntax before watching this video. Within this video I'll explain how we describe user requirements and how we set up our requirements documents with a division between functional and technical requirements. You can use this video as a reference if you start working on requirements within the Mechatronics Research Group, or you can use it as an inspiration for your own requirement documents. So, let's get started. I'll use the microwave as an example to explain some of the concepts. Of course, with a microwave you already know quite well what it should do, what it looks like, etc. In research or R&D projects, we often start out with a lot of unknowns which is a bit different from this microwave, so please keep that in mind. Let's think about this completely novel food heating box that we need to design for a customer. When we start a design, the first thing we need to define are what we call the user requirements. So you have to think about the stakeholders first before writing down what you will design. The first stakeholder that pops up in your mind is the user, but for a good design you have to think further than that. For example, who maintains or sells or recycles the device. So, how do you write down the requirements of the stakeholders? We call these the user requirements and we use a combination of user scenarios and language. In user scenarios, we describe in a piece of text or a flowchart how the stakeholders will use the product. So we write down what the stakeholder wants to do and not yet what parts will be used to make the product. An example. Um, so don't write the food shall be placed behind the door if you aren't sure that you'll use a door for the microwave. Maybe a portal could be a nice solution as well. Here's a simple example of what a user scenario for a home user of our food cooking box could look like. The user scenario describes the expected behavior of the product but not yet what makes one product solution better than another. Some things that make your stakeholders very happy are more gut feeling. Does it look pretty? Is it easy to use? Is it reliable or is it sustainable? These vague requirements cannot easily be described using ears, but there is another requirements technique called Planguage, which is made from planning and language. Planguage. Just like ears, Planguage is using structured language. The subject of Planguage is too large to describe in this video, but I think it's very important to at least try to describe a few of these things that are very important to stakeholders. So, now that we have a picture of how our product will be used and what makes the stakeholders happy, we can continue to the functional and technical requirements for which we will use EARS. So now I'll take you along on how we would make requirements for our micro um, food heating box. We start out by making a functional architecture where we describe what functions are connected to which parts. This is not a description of the parts of the microwave because we don't want to limit our design space, but a description of the functions and how those connect. Let's see and for the example keep it simple. So we need a, a, a home user and um, we need food and we need a novel food heating box. As you see, we now have a clear boundary of what is inside and outside of our system. Now we need to add the functions. Functions are a verb and an objective. Cook food, set timer, warn user, things like that. A good starting point is to look for the verbs in the user scenario, but we can also think of new ones that we need. I'll add functions in blue. So the oven needs to contain food. Um, otherwise we cannot place it in the oven. Let's add some relations to the food and to the user. We can already see that we can add functional requirements to these function blocks. The food heating system shall provide room to contain food that is maximum 20 by 20 by 20 centimeter large, for instance. Or um, when ice cream is placed in the food heating system and commanded by the user to defrost the ice, the system shall be able to defrost within 10 seconds. Hey, commanded by the user, so we need to add that. So probably there will be a user interface 
and um, I can add this as a part and give parts a different color, in this case dark grey. I don't know what the user interface will look like at this moment. It can still be a physical knob, but also maybe an Android app. But I'll add functions to show what needs to be done. As a function is a verb and an objective, I'll put provide food temperature setting and provide cooking time setting. The cool part of this is that I can now use this new part, user interface, as a system name in my ears requirements. When the home user changes the cooking time, the user interface shall indicate the updated remaining cooking time. Again, let's add some relations here. Now we can continue and add heat modulation, and probably there's a part that heats the food. And that can be a grill or a microwave, so I will also add this as a part. Um, and this way we we'll continue, adding parts that we are sure of and allocating functions. Ring an alarm to the user, for instance. We try to use functions where possible, but if we're completely sure that we're going to use some part, we're just going to add it to the architecture as a part. For instance, although I really like portals, we're just going to use a door. The door is there for a reason, so I'll place its functions here. The benefit of using functions is that we describe what behavior is needed without limiting the design solution space. The benefit of using components is that it's easier to describe what parts we are already sure of that we will use. If we would only describe the parts, we just describe the first implementation that comes to mind. We cannot make good trade-offs. For example, it's cheaper to use a rotating knob with a mechanical bell that enables both entry of cooking time, warning when cooking is done, and visual feedback of remaining cooking time. But I could also make a fully closed box without knobs and just let the user operate everything through an app and use a camera to show the cooking food. These are both possible if we only write down the functions of the device and what is required of those functions, instead of an implementation that is blocking your freedom for good design choices and trade-offs. The vaguer the wish of your client is, the better it is to write functions or functionality that is needed. It's pretty tricky to think in functions. In your head, you immediately jump to solutions. Try to zoom out again and think, of what that solution tries to accomplish. Then you can write down the functional requirements using ears. What I've just shown you is a very fast forward of an iterative process. Often we describe parts, functions, functional requirements and move functions and parts around. We merge some blocks, split some others and this way we create a better understanding of what the problem is we're trying to solve. Of course, communicating your progress with the stakeholders really helps to get an even better view of what functions are needed. Those were the functional requirements. They leave as much design space open as possible. The technical requirements are the requirements that limit the design space. What things are limiting to the design? In our templates, we use a few categories like safety, cost, product environment, mechanical, electrical and software design. In these categories, we make ears requirements. For example, the microwave oven shall comply to ISO 1610, or the microwave shall weigh less than 4 kilos because of user experience or legislation. As you can see, these requirements limit the design solution space. It's not always clear whether a requirement is functional or technical. Especially with safety, sometimes the functional part of safety is also a limitation to the design space. It's very good to think about this, but in the end it's most important to write it down somewhere. This is how we go from a customer wish to functional and technical ears requirements. There are some minor tweaks that we do to enhance our requirements. We add a rationale and a unique identifier. The rationale is a small sentence that describes why the requirement is important. We found that this really helps in the discussion and also to keep the requirements simpler. It also really helps to remind you why you wrote that requirement. 
So several weeks after writing it, you may have forgotten why we need 0.1 degree cooking precision. So let's take an example. When the timer expires, the user interface shall give a clear sound. Why do we need this requirement? Because we'd like to warn the user that the food is ready. So we could add that as a rationale. Maybe you already had a user requirement on ease of use that we can refer to and indicate that this has a relation to that user requirement. Secondly, we give each requirement a unique number. This identifier helps to couple tests to requirements and to couple requirements to each other. For example, in the rationale we can mention this number. Well, that's it. I hope this video made your approach to requirements easier. See you next time.